John Stack is Digital Director of the UK Science Museum Group. John joined the group in 2015 and he's responsible for setting and delivering its digital strategy. He manages the group's digital department, which encompasses the museum's websites, digitised collections, apps, games and on-gallery digital media. Prior to joining the Science Museum Group, he was head of digital at the Tate Art Galleries. And during his time there, he carried out a major strategy development, which asked, what would it take to be a truly digital organization where digital was the norm? And this work became a Harvard Business School case study. John's currently leading a project called Heritage Connector which explores the opportunities for computational analysis to build links at scale between collections. Though it's targeted at museums, I suspect this will be applicable across other sectors as well, and, and I'll be fascinated to hear about its outcomes. The global pandemic has brought the digital space into sharp focus for us all. And the title of John's presentation, Managing Digital in a Time of Accelerating Change, is I'm sure, very central to the current experience of all of today's audience. So, um, a little bit about the Science Museum Group, um, first of all. So, the Science Museum Group is, is, is five museums. So, it's the Science Museum uh, in London, uh, the Science and Media Museum in Bradford, the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester, the National Railway Museum in York, and the uh, and locomotion, which is in Shildon, County Durham. Uh, so we have, um, we're a national museum, and so we hold um, elements of the, uh, the national uh, collection. Um, and at the moment we're digitizing all of that material and putting it online. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, later on. Uh, we're very active on YouTube, uh, and social media, as you would expect. Uh, we also have a presence digitally on uh, Google Arts and Culture and on Art UK. Uh, and we're in the process of uh, uploading more of our content to um, Wikipedia to, so that we can uh, reach greater audiences there. So overall, we're very digitally active. I've been there for about six years and a lot of the first few years we're really putting in place building blocks to an infrastructure to start um doing more digitally and we're starting to see the kind of fruits of that now including obviously through the COVID-19 uh, lockdown so a little bit about the collections very diverse collections so if you said science museum group collection to everybody uh they immediately first thing they would say is well scientific instruments and yes there are scientific instruments but it's a lot more diverse than that so we have a large transport collection including Stevenson's rocket and also the Flying Scotsman. Uh, there's quite a large um, like uh, historical collection. So going back to Greek and Roman times, especially around um, the medicine collection. There's, there's a lot of mass produced objects. So cameras, record players, bicycles, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's, there's quite a substantial art collection as well. And one of the reasons we're part of Art UK and so active there is we're obviously, no one thinks we have an art collection. So that's a kind of route to those audiences. Uh, there's an enormous photographic collection, which is estimated to be somewhere about sort of four and a half million photographs. And we're really in the very, very early days of um, uh, digitizing that material. Uh, there's enormous numbers of uh, archival materials, which range from posters to maps to prints and so on, and through to sort of technical drawings. So these are sort of uh, Charles Babbage's drawings um, for the uh, different engine, which we held in our archive. Uh, so really, really diverse collection, and uh, uh, which tells a lot of different stories. And I'll talk a little bit more about storytelling a bit, a bit later on. Um, so thinking about this um, presentation, uh, I read the Digital Shift Manifesto and I thought it was really, really closely aligned to a lot of things that we're working on um, and thinking about. Um, and the manifesto kind of touches on things 
beyond the research libraries into cultural heritage uh, more generally, and I think probably also beyond that as well. And so these areas around skills, scholarship spaces and stakeholders and what the shift uh, might look like. So all the little the headings that appear under here, when I was reading it, I was doing a lot of nodding, thinking, yes, some of those things we feel like we're in good shape and some of them are still on a to-do list. <laughs> but I thought where I focus today is actually thinking about this uh, list which appears earlier in the manifesto which is really it says in order to fully benefit from the digital shift we need to and then there's 13 things um and so what they talk a, a bit to is the sort of conditions for change um and that felt like a kind of good moment to reflect on what it means to be a kind of digital leader and what it means to kind of try and implement some of the things that are kind of held in some of these areas here we we're just talking about and what does it mean to actually implement them um, within a large complex organization um, so i picked out there's 13 i picked out 10 of them and i grouped a couple of them together and these are kind of some reflections on what i think's uh uh, what's worked well for me, what I think the challenges are, and kind of looking at them in a lens of sort of reflecting back on what I'm doing now and what I've been doing really for the, um, the last 16 years. Because uh, I've been doing digital since it was just a bunch of scruffy people in t-shirts in the basement. And now of course it's like all the trustees want to talk about. Um, okay, so firstly, a clear vision and strategy and direction for decade long digital transformation and then kind of reliable foresight and horizon scanning capable to inform the above. So these are kind of four strategy documents that I've written, a couple at Tate, a couple at the Science Museum Group. And I, and I don't think there's really a one size fits all strategy for cultural heritage organizations, but, but I think there's some sort of themes uh, that emerge and I think each organization needs to think about its own readiness to address those themes, the urgency of them, the ones that, uh, and so actually the ones that are listed in the digital shift forum document are really good as a framing exercise. It's almost like you could go through those with a highlighter pen and think about ones that uh, apply to you or put them into some sort of logical order or prioritization. So the, um, but I think the areas that need to be included in these kind of strategy thinking, there's something around the user experience. So the, the actual people who are at the other end of the internet cable or across the desk or, or whatever, using this, the tools and services and content provided, there needs to be something in there around organizational transformation. Um, and we'll talk a bit about a bit more to that a little bit later but it's important that it's a uh, it's a recognition that any technology project also is an organizational change project i think it's worth having an eye to what funders might are prioritizing currently um and those could be um public sector or they could be um the Heritage, uh, National Heritage Lottery Fund, or the research councils, or even sponsors and other trusts and foundations and so on, because they have a particular set of things they're interested in. I think the strategy needs to have an eye to that, how it's all going to be funded. Um, I think it's interesting to look at changing audience behaviours and, and have that into the strategy document. And then clearly there's something around the technology landscape. And so across all of those things, it feels like you've got to have an eye to kind of both short, long, uh, and medium term considerations. Um, and so what I've done historically is bite off the strategy into sort of two or three year chunks, which kind of feel deliverable because the very long term st strategies um, tend to feel, quite, they have to be quite sort of nebulous because the technology changes so fast. So I think the things in the digital shift form as a 10 year project is, are the right ones, but I would break it down to something a bit more manageable. But actually like when I was, putting this together I was actually reflecting and thinking actually even within each e these two or three year uh, uh, chunks of work the things of thing new things have come things have been deprioritized so there's there is actually a need to adapt quite frequently and quite agilely and I suppose the other thing to say is like digital is like never actually finished uh, it's a thing that goes on forever um, so then thinking about kind of like horizon scanning and adopting things so um 
I think there's a lot of being the not being the not being, always being the pioneer, but being the person that comes second or third is actually quite a good thing. So these are a bunch of standards. Some of you probably know them. Triple I is an image format. There's a couple of copyright and open access things there as well. We've adopted all of these things, but we were not the first. You know, we were the ones who, you know, we'd go to spend a couple of years going to conferences and talking to people and seeing presentations and case studies before we adapted these things. So I think horizon scanning is not necessarily about being the most innovative and being the first person, it's about adopting these things at the right time. Um, and actually there is, there's a lot of reports coming out of funders and academics and, and, and industry, the NESTA, the Arts Council, the Horizon reports and so on. So there's actually quite a good body of reports and case studies that mean that the horizon scanning isn't too onerous, except for the fact that it is actually totally overwhelming because digital touches everything and it's really difficult to be a, Kind of expert on everything so the executive summary in the report is your friend read that <laughs> uh so thinking about organizational structures processes cultures um that em embrace and, and uh, respond to change this is something i've been doing a lot of thinking about this is a from a paper that was published at the museums and the web conference by Cathy Price from the v &A and Daffy James from National Museums Wales and it's really looking at different organization how you, how do you structure digital in an organization um, so one the, the one that I've become really interested in and and we've kind of adopted is a hub and spoke model which is that you have a sort of small centralized digital team but but a lot of the digital activity is happening out in the organization so in our case as a museum within our curatorial departments or marketing or learning collections and, and so on um, and so it's very much a partnership between a sort of small digital center and lots of people around the organization doing all kinds of things. So why why is that a good model versus others? In my view, it's good because it scales. Uh, you can do more digital stuff because there's just more people doing digital. It involves everyone, so it, it drives organizational change, whereas it, it's not like all the digital people are in that room over there and they're doing all the digital stuff. Uh, there's some risks in it and some things to keep an eye on because it risks fragmentation of the user experience or things not being done in a holistic way. So you've got to have sort of strong relationships between that, that center and the outside. And that can be done through different kinds of workflows or project approaches, or and certainly if you do things like um, training. The other, the other thing that's worked quite well for me over the years is doing things as kind of proof of concept or prototypes ahead of launching them. And that can be either to demonstrate that this is would be a successful approach and that, that we should therefore put more resources towards it or to actually try something new. So this is a like we, we wanted to produce new kinds of online storytelling tools for our collections. Um, and so we actually built this website very, very fast. We built it on an existing platform. It didn't really integrate with our collect with our search. And we built it sort of off to one side and it had a different design and all that stuff. But it was a way that very fast we could try out some of these different formats. Um, because that was really what we wanted to experiment in with the editorial, not the web design. <laughs> Uh, there was a bit of that in there. We wanted to build a prototype that said, what does it mean to engage with the science and technology collection online? Um, and a lot of that is to do with storytelling in the ways that kind of bring those audiences, uh, so bring those stories to life. So a kind of prototype approach, which means that you can do things sort of fast. And in, in the end, we like decommissioned this website. So we didn't spend very much money on it. And then we decommissioned it, moved all the content into our final approach and redirected all the links. So skills uh, and innovation and all the other things you see there, uh, yes, this is like really, really important. Um, and so this is not my team at the Science Museum. This is part of my team when I was at Tate, but it's a nice photo, apart from the coffee cup in the right in the foreground, <laughs> a bit late now. Uh, so, but both at Tate and at the Science Museum, I have like a really multidisciplinary team that covers editorial, design and user experience, video production, hardware, software development, web coding, data science, analytics and metrics, partnership management. Um, and those were the people at the, at the center. So they're also um, 
you've also got other skills pushed out. So it's it's so digital is like a really diverse set of skills. There's no like digital person, um, but you need to cover a, quite a broad area, which means that if it's a very very small team, it's it's really hard to find people that can cover across all of those things. Um, and so we like lots of others like have lots of contractors and specialists and consultancies around the edge so things that aren't full-time jobs but where we, we there are particular companies who we work with on like really specialized areas so accessibility audience um insight some of the really really naughty technical databasey stuff we have companies that we work with and so on um so this kind of it's a kind of hybrid model of some things in-house and some things with suppliers and i think that's pretty normal um uh but I think in addition, if you're in, in going back to the question about like how, you know, how do you have the kind of digital innovation and change and pushing things forward and so on, I think it's not just have you got all the skills, it's actually uh, do those people have the time to work on things that will push the organization forward? Are they encouraged to sort of experiment? Uh, do they have the time to like go to, to learn from others, to go to conferences, read case studies? are they encouraged to look across funding opportunities themselves um because ultimately what you want for a kind of to drive innovation is to have more ideas than you can possibly deliver so that as funding opportunities arise or uh or you're kind of shaping things for, for the future you're always sort of thinking what could we be doing next um I think the other thing to think about in terms of skills is some of the softer skills are, are, are as important, if not more important than some of the technical skills. So having technical people who can really engage with the curators who are often historians and um, humanities people by, by background, uh, or who can work in partnership with potentially external um, partners across a multi on a consortium project. So those softer skills I think are really, really important. Um, and it, the kind of, can I, uh, can do the digital people learn and train themselves? They tend to be curious people. And so they're looking for space to, to exercise their curiosity. But I think you're also looking for some people in there who can really be the people who face out into the organization and out to the world. Um, we've done quite well working with things like projects and bringing in staff for projects both in our own department but also in other departments around the organization and having um roles created through those projects which at the end end up being made permanent roles in the organization because you get to a point where no one can imagine the organization without them because they've demonstrated so strongly um how important and um their skills are So number five, so, so think about sustainable um, investment in digital in a constrained financial environment. It sort of pulls in a number of different directions here. So one of which is we've tried to just keep things simple and standardize things a lot. So we have a standard set of uh, like formats, I guess they are, into which lots of our content flows. So learning resources, these stories in the top right hand corner, peer reviewed articles, blog posts and so on. Uh, and so we try not to build too many new things. I mean, I'll talk about when we do build new things. We try to flow content into these areas um, um, because one of the challenges is that every new thing you create and it adds a layer of complexity. Um, and this is the most complicated thing, <laughs> which we do, uh, but, but it's an example of when you totally do want to like, jump into the deep end of the swimming pool and deal with the complexity. So this is a mapping from our internal collection management system onto which fields appear in which bit of the website and what features and functionalities those drive. So it's actually really, really complicated. You've got to like shunt data from internal systems to external systems. There's a big search index. Some of those fields do different things in the search. Some of them are links online. Some of them are drop down menus. Really, really complicated. Uh, but it's like the core of our offer. 
So, um, so where some of the bits of the things that we do, we have external suppliers, you know, ticketing systems, we mostly work with external suppliers because a ticketing system is a ticketing system for everybody. We have some unique things, but nothing uh, super complicated. This is really complicated and sort of, we need to own it in-house and we're always tinkering with it and changing, changing it. So, but doing things like this, what you incur is like a lot of technical debt. There's enormous amounts of code in here. There's a kind of, there's a, the, there's a lot of data complexity. Um, there's a lot of systems integration going on. And so the more of this kind of complexity you build, the harder it is to do new things within a kind of constrained financial environment where you're operational budget for your department is broadly speaking the same each year um over time if you're doing more and more complicated stuff you've got to maintain the things that you've built in um in the past and so the ability to innovate and do new things slows down with the more of this kind of stuff you have going on so it's something that you know we have a lot of com conversations about what do we how how to approach things in a, in a really sustainable way um the other thing we've done over the last few years is really try to like own the code. So while we're working with external suppliers to get all of the underlying software code so that's something that we own. And that kind of prevents vendor lock-in. It means it's easier to change things. And um, But then you've got to scale up. You've got to manage all this stuff. You've got to manage all this code and look after it and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So but it feels like really increasingly important to us that as an institution, one of the things that we do is make software in a way that, you know, even probably, uh, you know, 10 years ago, institutions didn't really make software. Now we do, we're in that business. Uh, and then there's, a, there's when to, no way to say goodbye. Um, and so this is a, very well loved and much used website. Uh, um, but in the end, it just became too, it started to break. The integrations were broken. It's, it's more than 10 years old. Uh, it's got lots of flash in it, which is the thing that used to be cool on the web and is now the thing that doesn't work on your iPad. In fact, it doesn't work anywhere now because it's been decommissioned as of the 1st of January. Um, so we no, no we, we, we decommissioned a lot of websites. In some instances, we entirely rebuilt them as they were in more modern technologies. So we rebuilt games that were in Flash and very popular. We rebuilt them in HTML5. This one, we lifted all of the content up and we moved it somewhere else in a, in a, in a shiny new design. But actually, I think uh, in addition to adding, being careful about adding new things, there's also having an eye to like, oh, we can archive this. Because we're government founded, we this is the UK government web archive, should have said, sorry, uh, which is run by the National Archives. And so as we build things now, we're actually quite careful about can they be archived or do they do they get archived really neatly? So one of the things that you don't get in the web archive, for example, is things like search don't work brilliantly, but you can build it in such a way that uh, those things are better. Um, so thinking about, okay, updated, flexible technology, uh ad advanced spaces that meet challenging user requirements so when i was at tate there's not actually very much digital in the museum there um because it's primarily an art museum there's audio guides and a few bits and pieces at the science museum there's absolutely loads uh probably more than any other museum in the country um and so I mean, this is not, it's probably not the sort of thing, that, same thing that you would have in a research library, but I think there's probably some, okay, so I'll just pick out some things that I think have really might cut across the two uh, and sort of reflecting on this point. Hopefully you can hear my dog barking. Um, okay, so number one, this stuff is really expensive uh, and it, it dates really quickly. So every child now consumes every screen is a touch screen and not only that it's a multi-touch screen and not only that it's going to be as responsive as their ipad is and yet it also has to be like battle hardened in the museum because there's going to be ten thousand school kids bashing away at it and eating their packed lunch of it um but it can give like a really high quality um experience to users because you can you know the context you can customize the content um and 
the, the, it can be like a real wow experience, um, especially if these are the kinds of technologies that people don't have in their own home. So this is actually much bigger than it looks in this photo. Anyway, it's a very, very large touch table the size of a single bed. Um, and it's kind of amazing. Um, uh, it's a four player multiplayer game. Um, but I think it's worth saying that the maintenance costs for hardware add up really quickly. You need spares, you need, uh, and there's a whole other set of skills which are not the same set of skills as building doing web development and building things online. That's a really unique set of skills, not just to build the thing, but also to maintain it and also to understand the user experience that you're trying to have. Um, so we're quite careful about when we implement this. We have a lot of conversations before we put like tons of digital uh, into a space and we do do it sometimes, um, but in other times we kind, of, we kind of step back away from it. I think one of the really interesting things about COVID-19 has been the kind of bring your own device thing and the, and the growth of things like QR codes and, wh and what and what of those behaviors will continue beyond the pandemic? I mean, the answer is we don't know, but it feels like, um, Lots more people are doing things like scanning QR codes, which suddenly means like, oh, this could be really something really interesting in the future. Uh, and I think it goes without saying, really fast, reliable Wi-Fi is, is always a good thing, especially if you have teenagers. Um, so have a defined role in discovery and access uh, in an open research content. So how we define our role um is absolutely tons of audience research um and of all different kinds and so we're trying really hard to define what it is our audiences need so there's things like web analytics can tell you like an awful lot because you can see what people are doing where they're coming from and stuff like that um you can also look at things like search terms, where people are coming from and what, what search queries are they putting in. Um, but we're now increasingly starting to do things like um, much more sophisticated online surveys, sometimes on, around specialist areas. We're doing follow-up telephone interviews in order to understand user needs better. Um, we've done focus groups. Uh, and we're now increasingly around the editorial content doing keyword analysis, which is looking at like uh, how strongly do search terms related to our, the content we're thinking of making, how highly, do, you know, how many people search those things uh, and how, would, how well would we rank? So to give you an example, um, if we produced content on the moon landings, the Apollo moon landings, uh, lots of people look for that content online, uh, but we actually wouldn't rank that well because there's an awful lot of content out there already. And we have an Apollo, one of the, the Apollo 10 capsule, so the one before the moon landing, the, the kind of dress rehearsal, I guess, uh, in the museum. But it's but it, we've kind of slightly shied away from doing too much content around it because it's so densely. A, a, an example at the other end is we looked at uh, navvies, who were the people that built the um, railways and canals also. Uh, and we don't have much content on them. People are very, very interested and there isn't much content online. So if we produce content on navvies, we would rank really well in search engines. Um, and, and so we try to sort of understand the audience behaviors and our place in there, our role, uh, in a couple of different contexts. One is around um, the content that people kind of like pull to them. So that's primarily via search in, search engines, Google primarily. Um, and so we've done lots of work around search engine optimization and search ranking. Then there's a question about like content that we like push out to people. So um, there are, um, so to give an example of the search, lots of our work around learning resources is really clearly tied to themes in the national curriculum because teachers are looking, searching by those terms. Around the pushing content out, a lot of that's to do with things like social media. So you're trying to position content into people's kind of stream of daily to daily digital content that they're consuming. And across both like push and pull content, there's this question about partnerships and who kind of amplifies reach either to a different audience or to a larger audience. Uh, and then, and then the, the, the kind of 
audience insight and the analytics and, and, and sort of understanding our changing role, there's always more to learn and it's always changing. So it, it's a kind of ongoing thing. So it's actually something that we're kind of starting to build a capability for in the museum much more strongly. Um, so a way to innovate in services despite an often ailing core technical architecture. Yep, I'd know that story. <laughs> Uh, have can have uh, innovation and continual service improvement embedded as a way of working. So there's two like things here, and they're sort of pulling in slightly uh, different directions, as you can see. Um, so I dug this out. Uh, ooh, didn't go forward. Okay, so this is. I mean, it's, I don't think it's like this is the technical architecture when I was at Tate. So at the bottom in pink are all like. In pink and yellow are like internal systems and databases and stuff. The blue is like various integrations and data services and all that kind of stuff. And then the green is all of the like services at the top and the gray, I think were the ones that we were trying to decommission. <laughs> uh, so what you see here is like similar to a lot of people, a lot of legacy systems, a lot of like legacy data. Um, so, and data in a format that isn't really sort of not what you want. You want something different, but because it's in this system and other things are connected to it, it's really hard to change things. And these systems are big and complicated. So we're often not in the business of changing them very often. Museums like review their collection management systems like every 10 years, which is why collection management systems tend not to innovate very, very fast. Um, there's some green shoots about, there's a lot of interesting conversations about collection management systems these days, so I shouldn't be too rude. Um, so what we try to do, what I've tried to do is do something very more modular and to actually accept there's, there's always gonna be this kind of complexity and that actually having multiple systems and having them loosely coupled and having kind of data services that push things around actually gives you some flexibility. So maybe having all these systems is not that bad because you can kind of manage the life cycle of them independently of each other. You can retire systems. Whereas if once it becomes very monolithic, lots of one big system doing lots of things, um, it can be quite difficult to change things uh, without breaking other things and, and so on. And so like actually having lots of different systems doing specialist things that are kind of lightly integrated with each other means that you can also run developments and changes sort of in parallel. Um, a lot of the time that these things are kind of replaced, they're done via projects. So you end up with this kind of like sawtooth investment model where there's like periods of large investment into one of these boxes and then periods where nothing happens to them and people are just kind of operationally keeping the thing running or making small configuration changes. So we generally, we've been trying to move to a kind of more, um, uh, you know, operationalizing some of those changes and doing more frequent changes and fewer of these larger transformations. And we try to get those projects to therefore contribute as broadly as they can. Uh, we've done lots of work on like open data and APIs. So trying to get our collection data in a machine readable format, which we then built all kinds of other things um, um, on top of. I'll show you a couple in a second. So, and then we have a, a kind of lab approach, which is a place in which to do experimentation and try things. And so uh, um, among the things that we've worked on, we did the first kind of 3D scanning work and we were pretty confident that 3D scanning technology was like here, photogrammetry and uh, uh, LIDAR scanning and so on. We were pretty confident it would be good, but we want to demonstrate to the organization, this is the thing, here's what we can do with it. Um, and interestingly, the place it played out and got most traction was in learning resources for classrooms. So teachers can pull these up on whiteboards. Those hotspots are, which are the numbers on the 3D scan are kind of um, aimed at uh, children. Uh, so with the open data, we've done things like hackathons to bring together developers so they can kind of, and in part, it's like a fun thing to do and let's build some fun stuff and eat pizza. And then, but on another level, it's also about us understanding how easy is this data to work with? Where do people get stuck? Um, so out of the, these, the hackathons, various like games were built um, and visualizations. 
uh, and so on using our open data once we, when we first um, released it. Um, and then once we had a kind of collections API, it suddenly became a lot easier to do things once we had open data. When people approached us, academics or researchers and so on, it became a lot easier just to be able to sort of provide them with like, here's the keys to the car, uh, go, and, go and play with the stuff. So this is, um, this is our like viral moment because on Friday, this is what this does is it queries our API and it says, give me a random object from the Science Museum group collection, which has a total page view count of zero. So i.e., if you click on the link, you're like the first person to see that thing since it's been digitized online. So we released it on Friday and it's, uh, and since then it's had like 150,000 page views. So it's kind of bowled us over a little bit, but the, in a way, and that's nice and everything, in a way, the interesting thing though is it's actually, when you look at it, it's actually only about 200 lines of code. Uh, and a lot of that is spaces. So the code's really nice and readable. So, because it, it's not really, all of the complexity is like somewhere else has been dealt with on by, by the open data thing. Uh, and so lastly, um, the capacity and capability to meaningfully steer or at least engage with artificial intelligence. So, um, so spoiler alert, Artificial intelligence is here, uh, and we're really interested in it and for a couple of reasons, which I'll go through now. So firstly, a lot of our catalog is really thin um, because we're digitizing things at speed and it's driven by a need to move out of our collection, our current collection store to a new one, which means we're photographing stuff, but the catalog records are really thin. So we've been looking at what are, what are computers really good at and what can they add? Um, and so, the these these are machine generated tags based on just looking at that image the computer hasn't got anything else to go on and the, okay so where is this technology now it's it's about 80 percent really interesting and 20 percent completely crazy um, wrong, and totally wrong so it's sort of where optical character recognition was a while ago uh in the and so this is a particularly good one the nice one i liked here was cobblestones because it's and that's like oh that's really nice our curators totally not put uh cobblestones into the caption but if you're interested in cobblestones we've got you covered now um so that's really interesting it doesn't feel ready to present on the web interface yet but we've been looking at things it's really good on you can see what it's trained on it's really good on photographs it's much less good on things like archaeological collections and things like that but it's definitely going to get better and you can kind of see what it's been trained on. It's quite good on products and things like that, especially the Amazon one, because it's obviously been trained on all the products in their shop. The, the Microsoft one's really interested in cake. So it quite often thinks things are cake. Um, this is kind of uh, clustering, which um, this was done by Kath Sleeman at Nesta, which took 9,000 things from a particular bit of the collection and then clustered them by visual similarity and then the outline colors are decades. Uh, and so again, the computer doesn't know anything. All it knows is it's just looking at the objects and trying to cluster them. So here you can see it's pulled together like compute, old style computer keyboards, uh, calculators, mobile phones. And so it's clustered these things together based on just how they look. So again, kind of really, you can start to see interesting ways in which collections might be explorable in the future. Um, and actually a lot of these things probably would have been in the same categories, but there are other bits where uh, in a way, it's more interesting the proximity of groupings of, of things than it is that, that it's got all the typewriters next to each other. Um, so then thinking about like clustering, one of the things we've been thinking about is what does it what does it mean if you can kind of cluster images by like how similar they are to each other, can you do the same thing with kind of like concepts in the catalog? So we have a grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, to, to, for 21 months to look at analyzing the actual catalog itself and try and build links between things in the catalog. So by analyzing the fields in the database, but also the free text descriptions and so on, and also associated uh, material uh, to start to build a kind of knowledge graph against uh, initially our collection, but soon the VNA's collection 
to see whether like computers can start the computer can start to like cluster together and and, and infer links between things um and so there's a there's a sort of complicated uh uh, set of techniques being used around matching entities between different systems, using Wikidata as a way to sort of bounce through Wikidata and pull in other data sets, uh, looking at uh, other things like gazetteers to, to bring in to help the machine. So sort of spo spoiler alert on how that's going. The, the It's really good at things like uh, really structured things. So stuff like dates, and countries, it's really, really good at. It's pretty good at people. Uh, it's less good at companies because often company names have like ands in them, especially older companies. They tend to have like longer names than a modern company, which would be much more sort of short word brand focused name. Um, uh, but that so off the shelf with an with an with a with a as it were an untrained machine learning model. So a model that's just you just plug it in and off you go. It does pretty well. So the those results are just that's an untrained model. Um, so but what we're going to do next is work out where's the best place to start to train the model and what things will it will it get good at. So in answer to the sort of question back here capacity and capability to steer or at least engage with machine learning. I think the answer is that a lot of this machine learning technology is gonna become a commodity in the same way that these days you would, if you wanted to buy an email system or collect, uh, or a um, customer service uh, system, you would sort of just buy one as a commodity, you wouldn't write your own. And so it's getting pretty close now and actually, Within a few months, we've got to the point where we're using the off-the-shelf systems, and we're starting to like work with the um, to, to, to in a light way, kind of train our own models. So I think actually uh, steering and engaging are almost the same thing, uh, but it is a kind of specialist skill. We had to bring in a researcher from outside, and we're uh, and he's come from IBM, and we are learning an awful lot from him. <laughs> uh, it's really really interesting work. And probably in the future, these things will sort of be built into system. I mean, this is how like Google and uh, Facebook and Pinterest and all these things work. All those, and uh, Netflix, all those discovery based systems are based on machine learning. And it's not that they're doing magic on their own. Someone behind the scenes is kind of tuning them and building them and, 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 and reinforcing things. But clearly as organizations with enormous amounts of content, this is something that we def definitely need to engage with. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> that was fantastic. What a first time um, anyone's mapped um, their presentation to the uh, to the manifesto, and, and it worked really well. Thank you. And I just love the the, the mix between the really practical and. The, and, and, and down in the dirt, as it were, and right up to the organisational theory. Wonderful. We, we've got a number of questions, and I, I, I and again, the questions reflect this. That there's some quite quite um, high level ones, but also some really practical ones. And I, I, I'll just lead off if I can by just coming back to. I noticed on your website you had a blog, which. Uh, talked it was a couple of years ago it was about implementing change from a digital department and what really struck me was none of the how-tos you gave were actually about anything digital and and the, so the message behind that is really interesting and I'd like to link that with if I can the a question that came in with thinking about the user experience what will a digital organization or a digitally um, transformed organization will do better for them mm. Um, I think listen, the I think what people I think what people expect from a user experience is something that feels really seamless. It sort of meets them where they are, and so um, and the challenge in a big complicated organisation is that there's a tendency for the user experience to kind of reflect the structure of the organization. 
Um, and so it's it's actually quite a lot of effort to always come back to what is the user going to experience? How will this make sense? And so to give an example, I mean, one of the examples that's always given of like a really terrible user experience is university websites. <laughs> So at the top, there's always like some like homepage with a really, you know, sunny day on the campus. And then maybe there's like a quote from the vice chancellor about their impeccable research credentials and all the rest of it. But once you get underneath, it tends to be like a total mess because it's very devolved. Everyone's just kind of putting in whatever they want. And so, but in a sense, maybe that doesn't matter because, you know, the philosophy department and the physics department are sort of next to each other in the directory, but they haven't really, to a great extent, got the same audiences. But actually, when you think about a collecting institution, what you want to give people is the is you put that in the search box, everything you might possibly have wanted has come there. We've thought through what you want to do. Um, so there's a kind of service design element I mean, this is what Gulf.UK have done, spent a lot of time working on, uh, and which is why the government's website now is actually quite good, because um, they've really come at it with a service design, from a service design standpoint. But that means bringing together disparate people from different places, because it could be that the data's coming from here, but the, the other people are coming from here. And so there's a lot more kind of conversations to make great service. Yes, yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, so um, thank you. So, uh, just moving on slightly, I mean, one of the things that obviously strikes you, and you, you talked about high speed Wi Fi, etc., everything's digital. What about digital exclusion? And this is something that's in the, it's in the news at the moment, and yeah. interesting to us because we, uh, RL UK, is planning a, a, an event on digital exclusion, poverty, and the role of libraries later this year. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, really important. And so, yeah, not everyone has high speed Wi-Fi, not everyone has a laptop at home. And so I think it's going to become more and more of an issue. I noticed there's just like a seminar in about in a couple of weeks from the School of Advanced Study on exactly this subject, which I was thinking, yeah, I must sign up for that. So a plug for them. I think it's on, I want to say Thursday the 17th. But, it, but it's on like access to access to collection and sort of um, what does it mean when everyone doesn't have access? So I sort of don't have an answer, but I, th I agree it's, it's, it's increasingly being an issue. And you see it with like school kids who don't have laptops. Yeah. I, I, I keep thinking Fusion's going to do it when, when we get there. Um, I, moving... Uh, again slightly further I just one that's just come in uh, talking about the um discussion you talked about financial sustainability of digital what about the environmental sustainability and how is yeah. glam organizations we can meet current user needs while also doing the environmental um, support yeah totally and so in fact it was one of the it was one of the other things I, I started and I started to write on it and then because it's it is in one of the, it is one of the 13 in the initial list but then I like whittled it down to 10 in order to try and keep to time so so I think yes so I think in part it's about the suppliers that you work with um, and so um, for example we've moved all of our um, primary website hosting to um, Microsoft Azure because and, and we didn't have in the ranking factor green credentials of the suppliers but I think that is the way to do it and if we had they probably would have come out top um, so I think it's really imp a really important uh, consideration things like machine learning are in like if you train your own model from scratch it's incredibly computationally intensive um, so most of this stuff is now not going to be done in our buildings. It's going to be done in the cloud. So I think it's therefore really important to look at those cloud service providers amongst other things. Um, hardware, again, like e-waste is a massive problem. Um, so, you know, things in the museum, thinking about their lifetime and their life cycle and where could they go after we finished with them is also really important. Right. So moving on to the slightly more um, practical. Um, so there's a question around, do, know, do you diversify between different user groups and the services you build and the content? Yeah, 
And some of them, some things are designed for multiple different user groups and some are really, you know, that we did, there's a website for teachers and there's, um, we often talk about doing a website for, for children. Uh, some things have to cut across them all. The, the tricky one is, the, is actually the collection because that needs to be everybody from like a kind of a 10 year old who's suddenly interested in airplanes all the way up to a kind of doctoral student and everybody in between. And so that's, that, that's quite often the tricky one is how, um, but yes. We absolutely zone off bits of the bits of the content for specific audiences because they have particular needs. Uh, yeah, indeed, I, uh, and uh, uh, a really um, uh, interesting one is I don't know how you didn't really talk about the methodologies you use, but there's a, a current um, tendency predilection for many organisations to use agile. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, as a way of doing things, and you didn't talk about it, but uh, yeah, we totally do. We uh, yeah. agile software development, um, which, in a nutshell, for those who don't know, it it tries to well, there's a whole bunch of things, <laughs> but it it tries to accept that the more you work on a project, the more you know about the difficulty of implementing things, what's important, what isn't. So it's quite a flexible format. And so it really lends itself very, very well to especially software development. So if, it, if we're building something and it's like an online shop, we sort of know what that is. <laughs> and so we tend to just do a lot of upfront specifications because we don't like, give that to a supplier. When we're building something really complicated, like a collection or something that's using computer vision, we totally work in an, in an agile way um, because everything is a conversation and the more frequent those conversations are, the, the, the better. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've totally drunk the agile Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm conscious of the time. I, well, if, if you don't, if we can run over a couple of minutes, yeah, yeah, that yeah, would sure. really help us at, at a couple of points. So, uh, and so linking with that and methodologies, um, big difficulty we've got in academic libraries is we manage a lot of legacy software applications. You've mm. thought about this. Um, uh, and as the questioner uh, comments, you know, all of which are um, critically important as far as the researchers co are concerned. But do you have any internal guidelines on, on when you write, rewrite code bases to keep them modern and alive without pain? Uh, and you know, what linking is there a link at all with you with your agile the agile approach? We don't really have guidelines. Um, what we do often do with some of these legacy systems is we just is we try to get like the data out into something else that we can work with in a much more flexible way. So also like we have a number of collection management systems and the data structure is very complicated and very rigid and it goes back like decades and probably even to card indexes before that and then ledgers before that so some of it is probably more than 100 years old um, and they're really difficult to work with in their current format so we tend to like just try and get the whole thing out into something that we can work with so some like a, some other data structure or into an elastic search index. And then we tend to build on top of that. So we try to sort of abstract away from some of the legacy systems. I know that's not really what the question's asking, um, but um, it just means that we can work on top of things because those systems are probably not going anywhere without some major implementation project. So sort of different. Okay, thank you. And the last couple, I mean, you, you mentioned API, hmm. uh, an API, and, and so I'm, I'm, are the collections discoverable and searchable via an API? Yeah, if you wanted to, you could. In fact, the collection is open source, so if you wanted to, you could uh, download the collection website on GitHub, put it on your laptop, and then point it at our collection API, and you would essentially get our collection running on your laptop, which you could probably <laughs> do. In, you could probably do it in an afternoon if you really wanted to. Correct. But don't tell your boss that's what you're doing. <laughs> so, and so essentially that the API that the API is the the, uh, the public API is the one that we're actually using. It is the live one. And so yeah. 
So you can fire search queries at it. In fact, there's things you can do in the API uh, if you start to dig around in it, which are not available as features on the website yet. So actually, you'll see things there that, so for example, the image tags are in the API, but they're not used in the website search index currently. That's interesting. Uh, I, I, that's a nice challenge for someone. Yeah, someone's PhD. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and last question, and, and uh, coming back to, to users, um, always the core. I'm looking at the touch table and the digital services generally. How do you evaluate users' reactions and the payback and user engagement for the level of resource of input you put in? Uh, for, like in the museum itself, is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so they're really integrated into the experience. So where they are. So we do, um, there's sort of three parts to that. So there's formative evaluation, which is done on, is this the best way to deliver the content? So, um, you know, uh, what problem are we trying to solve is, is very, very tightly defined up front. Then there is a prototyping stage or sometimes even two or three prototyping stages. And that can be a technical prototype on a, running on a computer, or it can be like a paper and cardboard prototype that just says, this will happen and then you do this. And so one of the nice things about being a museum and I guess a library is you have people there. So you can sort of say, why don't you come over and can you spend like 20 minutes with us? We're gonna talk you through this exhibit and you can try it. Um, and sometimes the thing changes quite radically at that stage. It's not uncommon as you will be unsurprised to hear to find that things get really simplified at that stage. There's a tendency to make things overcomplicated as a user experience. So they, they often get some, made more simple. Um, and then there's a summative evaluation, which is um, observational. So it's normally somebody, it can be um, just watching and counting the number of people using things, but there can be kind of shadowed visits as well, especially if it's like a kind of, uh, for particular audiences. So there'd be like a kind of shadowed visit, visit of a number of, um, school groups or families or whatever and then there'll be kind of interviews afterwards so it's, there's actually a lot of evaluation science museums tend to be really really good at like evalu uh, evaluation because science communication is really complicated and so it's not necessarily about the, the learning outcomes are not necessarily about the facts they're often about things a little bit more yeah, I, sort of fuzzy. I, I, I said that was the last question, but I've had another one which I, I do want to ask you, um, and it's about you. <laughs> so, <Go on. laughs> good, good. so, what what are the digital projects or sites, not necessarily cultural, but any that inspire you and make you happy? I think it's a lovely question to end um, on. I really, I'm really interested in like. Um, Sometimes I feel like all websites look the same these days. So I'm kind of really interested in unusual design. Um, what else? Um, oh, goodness. I've, got, I've usually got like 10 obsessions on the go. Let's think. I saw a really nice thing uh, last week from the British Library where they'd taken their sound collection. So well, someone had taken their sound collection and made a kind of virtual, it was all recordings in forests and, it, and they created a virtual like forest and you put your headphones on then with your computer keys, you sort of went, went through the forest and as you moved around to different parts of the forest, the different sort of birds sang to you, which I thought, I thought, oh, that's a really nice kind of way of engaging with the cultural heritage um, collection. Because it's kind of very experiential. Um, what else? There was a there was an audio experience that was done at the um, banqueting hall um, in Whitehall. I don't think it's there anymore. It's called the Lost Palace, which is an audio experience that you did, and you put on headphones and you carried. I think it was um, an, a, a thing, and you travelled around the streets around and using like GPS and um, and so on. It took you on a kind of experience of the palace that used to be there, which and again that was a really nice. And it played to all the strengths of digital, and yet because it was um, uh, in an audio experience, you were still sort of like engaging with the world and it encouraged you to do things like look up at particular buildings and said up there would have been 
the, the room of so-and-so and the river would have come to just here. So some of these kind of like, like immersive experiences, I think are really, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, and you, you, one of the things you've talked about today has been the complexity and simplicity. Uh, and just picking up on your, I'd just like to say your own website, you've got the text at an angle across the page, yeah. which is really not normal. No. <laughs> I, find, I find that really disconcerting in a really good way. <laughs> so I think There's a trend in website design called brutalist web design, which is kind of web design, which is supposed to be kind of like unforgiving and kind of, uh, well, brutalist. Uh, so it was a bit of a nod to that. Yes, and it worked. It was really it worked. So thank you, John. That that that's it has been a wonderful session. Really fascinating, and um, a great addition to our series of forums. Um, so you know, really appreciate it. And and there's been comments in the the, the chat about the the outcomes of the AI project, which, as I said, has, has really interested me, and it's high relevance to libraries, very very much so. Uh, and yes, so the thanks are coming in. Well, you can see it your, your, yourself from the chat. Um, so thank you, John.